I will be forever grateful to the Harvey Awards Committee uh, for letting me host last year, in part uh, because it was an excuse for me to introduce myself and meet uh, Darwin Cook. Uh, I was a huge fan, and Darwin was everything that a fan could have hoped that he would be. Uh, he was humble, he was gracious, um, we had the opportunity to become friends uh, after that evening. Uh, I believe that he was a giant in our industry, uh, but in many ways um, could really define the term gentle giant. And I think it's um, really quite sobering and worth taking a moment to realize that Darwin was on the stage last year presenting, not receiving, but presenting a Lifetime Achievement Award. So maybe it's worth taking a moment to remember his lifetime and his achievements. Wherever you are, my friend, Godspeed. So now let's focus on the living. Uh, we're a room of comic book creators, so I assume that really no one uh, needs me to run through a bio of Paul Levitz. Um, so instead, I'm going to tell a personal story. I, I first met Paul about a decade ago when I was starting to introduce the Fifth Beatle to the comic industry. And I was in the very enviable position that Vertigo uh, was interested in my book. And like many people of my age, I grew up reading comics. Uh, and there was a period of my life where I had stopped reading comics. And it was the classic Vertigo books that, that brought me back uh, to, to my passion for comics. So the idea of, um, of being on Vertigo was, felt like some sort of holy grail. Uh, it was, and, and, this, and it was through these, these meetings uh, that I met Paul. We were introduced to, for, for business reasons. We, we've since become friends, but we were not friends then. And as I'm sure you, many of you also know, I've been working for a number of years, ever since I started working on a graphic novel, I was also uh, planning to adapt The Fifth Beetle into either a film or a television series. Uh, it's a great labor of love for me. Brian, I refer to Brian as being as my historical mentor, and I had always intended to write the screenplays or teleplays myself and to be intimately involved in the production of, uh, of these adaptations. So Paul Levitz, who I again will remind you, was not a friend at the time. He pulled me aside and he said, you know, you told me, you mentioned about this adaptation that you're so passionate about. Um, if that is something you truly care about, you should be very careful and, and think twice about signing with us because we are part of the Warner Brothers family and there's no way that our legal team is going to allow you to retain those rights. And they may tell you that it will be one big happy family and the film will come out on Warner Brothers and it will be great, and it might. But, but it also might not. And when you enter the belly of the beast in that sense, uh, you need to be prepared uh, for things not to turn out the way you might want them to. So he didn't tell me not to do it, uh, but he gave me what was the most invaluable piece of advice that I had received in those days. And I'm very happy to report that the fifth people is being adapted into a six-part television miniseries of which I'm writing all the episodes, and I'm intimately involved as the executive producer and there's a direct line to that happening from that advice that Paul Levitz gave me about a decade ago. So I will be forever grateful to you. And I like telling that story also because I think it really gets to the heart of who Paul Levitz is. He is a guy who cares intensely about creators and cares intensely about the art. Now, in the off chance that there's anyone in this room who doesn't know his background, I'm really doing this for the benefit of my wife, Tracy, and many other spouses who may have been dragged to the Harvey Awards tonight. Uh, Paul was a senior executive uh, for DC Comics for almost three decades, where he ultimately served as its president and publisher. Uh, as an executive in that role, he shepherded uh, uh, massive adaptations like The Dark Knight in film and Smallville in television, so he knew what he was saying when he gave me that advice. Uh, but Paul is also an incredibly accomplished writer on titles like Superman and Batman in the creative space, but also in the historical space. Important books like 75 Years of DC Comics and Will Eisner, champion of the graphic novel. Uh, Paul has retired from his business uh, responsibilities to focus on his writing and also to teach. Uh, and I have the great honor of having been asked a few times to guest lecture at Paul's classes in New York. And whenever I do that, he has said, you know, you can just come in for the part of the class that, that's your lecture, and you don't have to stay for the whole thing. But I always say, I'm going to come for the whole class because there is always something you can learn from Paul Levitz. So it is my great pleasure to welcome to the stage tonight 
a true hero and mentor of mine, Mr. Paul Levitz. sponsored by the Hero Initiative, which does so much wonderful work for the creators in our field who need help. And sadly, over the years, many, many creative people do. It's a very hard country to make a living in creative arts, whether it's comics or otherwise, for an entire lifetime. And people hit rocks, and Hero does well with it, and many of you I know support that actively as an organization. If you don't, you might think twice about that one. We're giving the Lifetime Achievement today kind of misnamed this time, because really, Joe Giella has spent at least two lifetimes <laughs> producing wonderful comics. In a career that began in the 1940s, working for Hillman, working for Timely, and then moving over to DC, with DC for a lifetime's worth of comics, working on newspaper strips through all of that time, and then deciding, you yeah, know, I'll sell them, I got this time to slow down, I'll do just, I'll do a daily newspaper strip. How <laughs> tough can that be? Producing 25 years of Mary Worth in his quote unquote retirement, and then finally putting his pen down about a month ago, I guess. Astoundingly long and productive career. I had the pleasure of working with Joe as an editor and in the days when I was responsible for DC meeting its deadlines. He was on a very short list of people you could call in to solve problems at the last minute, fix an art job that might have some challenges, fill in for an anchor who hadn't gotten his work in on time or who had bailed on a job at the last minute. And no matter how ridiculous the problem presented to him, he took it calmly, at least to all outward appearances. <laughs> his family would have to fess up and tell me if, in fact, when he got home, he spent the time cursing. But it doesn't really sound like Joe. Uh, and the job would appear on time, seamless, professional, and always looking like the absolute best he could do. It was a wonderful thing to be able to count on someone like this. And I was not the only editor in the field who viewed him not as the inker of last resort, but the inker when you were at your last resorts, who would save your ass and do it gracefully. So I'm deeply grateful and very pleased because of that. I'd also like to point out that this is a unique lifetime achievement award for the comics industry in a really interesting fashion. We've kind of been off and on since the beginning of the field in deciding whether inkers matter. Back when we started royalties in the mainstream part of the business, and we had lengthy debates about the relative share that ought to go to writers versus artists. This just had never been done before. Vic Giordano, who's been very rightfully praised earlier this evening, and of course, among many things, one of the most extraordinary years the business had, took the position of, hey, we're not so important. We don't need that much. It's the, the penciler that's the whole thing, and the writer. They, they did the amazing stuff. We just show all the crazy stuff up. Um, we know better now. There are ample categories for best in here. In 1962, I do history, I'm sorry. It's one of the things I do. When the first group of people sat down and made the first ever awards for comic books, because there hadn't been any, nobody really gave a damn, it wasn't worthy of awards. But the first time the Alley Awards, the first awards in our industry were ever created, they didn't have an income award. Inkers weren't important enough yet. But the 
best single issue in 1962 was in conjunction with Yellow. Flash number 123, an issue that the geeks in the room will surely remember as being one of the more important comics public, published for a generation. Are you looking at me? Um, <laughs> you probably can tell us exactly the language on each page. That's what I'm looking to you. Um, so Joe counts as one of the people to win the very first awards for comics ever. And now, two lifetimes of work, or a lifetime and a half of work after that, it's a real pleasure to present the Lifetime Achievement Award. One last little Joe Giella story, also related to sort of an award situation. A decade ago, at uh, another convention whose name we won't mention in a somewhat sunnier state, um, <laughs> we were unveiling the U.S. Postal Service's first broad set of DC stamps. And it was a lovely, lovely day. We had gathered together many of the creators who had done the artwork on the stamps that were being shown off, and we were giving them all breakfast, and they were all talking to each other and having fun. And Carmen Infantino and Jim Lee are comparing stories. And so what was it like to be the best artist in the business when you were doing it? Um, past publisher and the future publisher in DC. And you know, most of the artists got to come up and say three or four sentences about what things were. I can't do great impressions of people, so forgive me for the quality of this. But Joe just stood up there, and you could see how moved he was to see a stamp that was artwork that he had helped create. It was just this is the best moment in my life, except my wife, Shirley. <laughs> That's who we got here. And I don't know that this one's going to compete and beat that moment, Joe, but maybe this can go in competition. Shirley being on a U.S. Postal stamp and getting a lifetime of achievement in the, world, <laughs> in the presence of your peers, your fans, and so many people in this room who grew up loving your work, and a couple of us have had the privilege of loving your work and working with you. Joe Giello, please.